Welcome to episode number 317 of Category 5 Technology TV. It's Tuesday, October the 15th, 2013. Mm-hmm. Great to see you. I'm Robbie Ferguson. I'm Krista Wells. Welcome, welcome. So let's get right into it, folks. Coming up in the room, newsroom tonight, if I could pronounce that correctly. Um, so a new wireless pacemaker is less than a tenth of the size of usual and is approved in the European Union. A secure email service is going to be developed in Brazil. Uh, Ford is working on tech that takes over your vehicle in event of a pending collision. Exciting. Mm. A frightening exploit has been found in DL Link routers. Mm, stick around. These stories are coming up later in the show. Speaking of fright, it's so appropriate for you know mid-October, yes. but there is a frightening new virus that's making its way around the internet, and uh, we felt it very important tonight. We're dropping format. We're going to tell you all about it. Uh, this is the worst virus that we've seen in modern computing uh, over the past you know, 10, 15 years. Um, so we're going to actually have Adam Kajawa joining us uh, from Malware Bytes in just a couple minutes. It's going to be a great show. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, and uh, certainly it's going to be uh, exciting to learn all about uh, some yes. great stuff. We've got some viewer questions as well. So don't go anywhere. This is Category 5. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Starring Sasha Dermatis. Hillary Rumble. Krista Wells. Eric Kidd. And your host, Robbie Ferguson. At EcoAlkalines, we believe you should be able to trust your batteries not just here, but here, here, and here. But with one exception, you should also be able to trust your batteries here. EcoAlkalines are the world's first and only certified carbon neutral battery manufactured to the highest standards of recycling and quality, without any trace amounts of harmful chemicals like mercury, lead, or cadmium. EcoAlkalines provide performance that rivals leading national alkaline battery brands at a comparable price. Find out more about the EcoAlkalines difference. EcoAlkalines.com Broadcasting since 2007, Category 5 Technology TV has grown year after year, faithfully bringing viewers hundreds of one-hour episodes focused on helping with their tech questions, assisting with the migration to Linux and other open source alternatives, presenting new and interesting tech products, and providing insightful interviews and demonstrations. All this is provided free of charge. We are now in our seventh season, and it's time to improve the viewing experience, make the show look and sound great. We continue our focus on fun, educational broadcasting. Stand with us as we build a brand new studio for Category 5 Technology TV. Bringing Category 5 TV to the world with better visuals, full 1080p video, and a permanent sound isolated studio. We have big dreams and we want you to be a part of them. Please support Category 5 Technology TV. Visit cat5.tv slash studio to be a part of our crowdfunding campaign for a limited time. With contributor perks brought to you in part by Category 5 Technology TV. Bag to Nature compostable garbage bags. Eco-Alkaline's environmentally responsible batteries. Free Play human powered devices. NetTalk Duo 2 with free calls to the USA and Canada and no monthly phone bill and the Android-powered Rico Magic Mini PC. We thank you for your support. Please visit cat5.tv slash studio today. This is Category 5 Technology TV. I'm Robbie Ferguson, your host. I'm Crystal Wells. So good to see you. That is, always. How you been? Oh, you know, good and stuff, keeping busy. Good, good. Yeah. And yourself? Excellent. Yeah, definitely busy. Good. That's just the nature of the whole thing. Just busy folks. Here we go, folks. It's mm-hmm. an exciting time for us, for sure. <laughs> Good stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, um, as most of you know, Category <laughs> 5 is a member of the TechPodNest Network, Tech 
podcast network if it's tech it's here and the international association of internet broadcasters all right and you can check out our mobile website scan that code m.cat5.tv you can listen live view the show live and uh, that is our mobile website available to you on your mobile device m.cat5.tv okay folks well there is this nasty virus that's going around. It's called CryptoLocker. And we've been seeing a growing amount of this uh, making its way around the internet. And so I've asked our good friend Adam Kajawa from Malwarebytes to join us on the show. And thankfully, able to be here tonight. Adam, it's so good to see you. Thanks for joining us at Category 5. No problem. Glad to be here. So we're going to talk a little bit tonight, Adam, about this crypto locker, locker virus and uh, what it means to the viewers. Uh, I think what it boils down to is that this is probably one of the most destructive viruses that we've seen in a very, very long time. Perhaps you could shed some light on uh, what is so, I guess, frightening to the end users when it comes to crypto locker. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> sure thing. So a lot of people have probably heard of uh, what we call ransomware, which is just uh, malware that... that the FBI ransomware is the biggest one. Um, it locks down the desktop and makes it impossible for the user to access their, their files or even the start menu. Uh, and they end up having to you know, remove it by safe, going into safe mode or, or various other uh, methods. Um, CryptoLocker is different in that it doesn't necessarily lock out the desktop. Instead, it encrypts uh, all the personal files of the user, which means their, their documents, their images, things like that. Um, it encrypts it uh, dually with, with two different types of encryption. Um, first, locally, uh, encryption with a key that it creates then and there with AES encryption. And then it pulls down a key that's randomly generated from a Kubernetes control server oh. and encrypts what is already encrypted with RSA encryption. Um, without that particular key uh, that's only located on the remote command and control server, it's virtually impossible to get your files back. So now viewers think, okay, well, encryption, that's a good thing, right? You'd think so. So consider that here's a virus that, in fact, encrypts your data with encryption that you cannot decrypt. So mm. there's this big problem, Adam, and that is that when your computer becomes infected with this crypto locker uh, malware, virus, whatever you want to call it, I would call it a virus at this point with the way that it's behaving, um, the antivirus products, even the, the highest, you know, the best and well-graded antivirus products, they'll remove CryptoLocker, but the problem is, is that it's too late. All of your files are now lost. And so yep. that's where this, you know, it becomes one of the most devastating viruses that, uh, that we've seen in a long time. Is there anything we can do when our files have been lost to CryptoLocker? Um, well, no one ever advises to pay the fine. No one in the media security uh, community will advise to pay the fine that CryptoLocker charges the users in order to get their files back um, for multiple reasons. One, you don't want to you know, feed the beast. Yeah. And the other reason is that uh, it's not a guarantee that you get your files back. In fact, CryptoLocker has uh, a timer on it. If you don't pay within, I think it's 48 hours, um, the fine, then the key to unencrypt your files is deleted. And so it's gone forever. And there's no way possibly to get them back. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, we'll talk a little bit about what we need to do to prevent data loss in event that we get infected. And, and people will think, okay, well, you know, I run Linux or whatever, but fact is most people have one or two Windows computers, especially if you're on a business network. And that's something that's really frightening is that CryptoLocker will actually go out spidering through mapped network shares and actually encrypt network shares on your network. So companies who have, for example, a single folder shared to all of the computers, right. you know, they may all have what they call their P drive or their Q drive or whatever, and that's yeah. where everybody drops their company documents and Excel spreadsheets mm -hmm. and they share those files. One of those computers on the network gets infected and suddenly nobody has access to those files. They're completely gone. There's no way to get them back. Exactly. Right. That's scary. a really real <laughs> threat. That's very, very scary stuff. So I'm careful. Mm -hmm. I've got the latest antivirus app. How could I get CryptoLocker? Uh, CryptoLocker is, is uh, distributed via exploits, uh, drive-by exploits, um, mainly, as in most malware these days is. So are we talking uh, uh, infected files or an infected website? 
as an infected website that you might visit if you're not using a up-to-date uh, version of, a, of a, a Java or Flash or something like that. I see. Or even one that just has a vulnerability in it. Um, the site can, the page can exploit your browser or yeah. that particular application like Java. Is and, say, uh, is say Chrome control. or Firefox safer than Internet Explorer? It's really a toss in the air. I personally say I like to use Chrome. Mm-hmm. Um, Firefox has had its own bugs, and Internet Explorer has always has come a long way, uh, and it's much more secure than it used to be. But I still recommend using something like Chrome. Okay. But it really comes down to just the extensions you use, uh, and the add-ons, and things like that. If Java is installed for your browser, regardless of the browser, right. and it's in an older version, it may be susceptible to an exploit. Hmm. Now, do we need to okay. remove Java? Do we need to? I disable. I mean, you, you have you have Java running on your operating system. Uh, for instance, if anyone plays Minecraft, uh, you would have to have run Java to play Minecraft. Well, that's on your operating system. Um, inside your browser is an extension to use Java, and that can be disabled. In fact, Firefox usually disables it automatically. Okay, um, so we can disable the extension rather than the actual program. When there's a known vulnerability and there's no patch for it, uh, hmm. it's, it's, it's best to just disable it entirely. And honestly, you don't need it all the time. Got it. Um, if there's a specific occasion when you might need Java on your browser, you can re-enable it to use it. Uh, otherwise, you can look at YouTube or, or do whatever you want. You don't have to worry about it. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, as many of you know, we're a Linux-based um, kind of show here, so I know all our Linux viewers are curious to know if they're safe, but then there's lots of other platforms as well out there. For example, I'm a, I'm a Mac user primarily, so Linux users, Mac users, anyone else, are we safe, are we not? Right now you are. Okay. <laughs> right now. It's just a matter of time. Um, as we've seen over the last few years, uh, Apple products, Apple operating systems have been targeted a lot more. Sure, yeah. And, you know, it's it's almost, it's just not much of a target as it was. I mean, it, it's become much more of a target that people use Apple products or, or even Linux products. And we've seen Linux malware, we've seen Apple malware. Um, and it's just a matter of time before this style of malware makes it over. But CryptoLocker itself is a Windows-only problem at this point? For now, yes. yes. I see. Okay. Uh, in general, what can we do to protect ourselves against uh, this type of thing? Is there something that we can, you know, obviously you're with Malwarebytes, and, and you know, I, I use um, various antivirus from ESET, um, and the fact is, is no matter what antivirus you're running, it's it's still able to get through, which is a very, very scary thing. And as I was mentioning at the beginning of this interview, it will detect and remove the virus, but by then it's too late because your mm-hmm. files are already encrypted. I'm not a viral programmer, so I don't know how that's even possible, but it's it's very, very scary. So what can users do, and is there something that you're doing with malware bytes that uh, is more effective than, say, just our, our antivirus in and of itself? Well, there's two main methods of protecting yourself from something like CryptoLocker. Um, the first is using an antivirus, any malware uh, type tool, um, one that, that uses a, a proactive approach and then it prevents execution of the malware to begin with. Yeah. Uh, or even we have a product, uh, our by Jacket Exploit. Um, other AVs have similar products that block exploits from even executing on their system. I see. Um, which is a great way to stop it. However, new variants are made all the time of different kinds of malware, especially something like CryptoLocker. So while today, all the AVs might protect against one variant. Tomorrow, they may not protect against that one. Yeah. So the best thing to do, honestly, uh, to stay safe from this particular threat is to use backups. Um, backing up to something on a network is obviously not a good idea. Yeah. But using something like backing up to, to a cloud service or uh, even just using System Restore for Windows um, mm-hmm. is, a, is a great way to keep your files safe. And... Uh, and you may not get the, the most recent version, depending on what your backup is. Sure. But you can still get them back regardless. You know, and that's a, a very honest answer, and I, I greatly appreciate that on behalf of our viewers. Um, backup and back up your backups, I think, is, is really the only way that you yes. can really protect yourself from this. Um, I, I actually, you mentioned about Windows Restore, and it's one of those things that, you know, sometimes we turn that off because uh, it takes up space on our hard drive. But I did find that CryptoLocker was unable to touch volume shadow copies, which is an exciting thing because Windows 7 out of the box is going to have a volume shadow copy enabled for what? Your documents folder. 
And because yeah. of that, if your documents get corrupted in the documents folder, you can in fact revert to a previous timestamp by right clicking on the folder, going properties, going into previous versions, and you'd actually be able to recover those files after you've used your antivirus product to remove the, the infection. So exactly. that is effective, but where that goes wrong is like you say, what if you your volume shadow copy is out of date or what if you know you're running low on hard drive space and so windows allocates very little to your volume shadow copy and you've got a massive documents folder then that's a big problem so uh, yeah. cloud backups definitely mm-hmm. off-site backup some of the off-site backup solutions and i'll put some links in the show notes for episode number 317 uh, but they'll actually offer incremental backups which means mm-hmm. you can choose a date before the infection took place and actually revert your files which is a fantastic way to do it amara vice has a secure, a secure backup solution as well um, but oh, anyone wants to work as long as it, it takes them off of your system and yeah. stores them somewhat secure but like i said doing it on the network even having a, a remote or a, a usb drive to back all your files yeah. up on if it's still plugged in it's susceptible to being it's gone backing. And we think yeah. we've tried to reiterate to our viewers as well, Adam, that a RAID 1 architecture, for example, as a backup solution is not actually a backup solution. It's, it's a fail-safe against a failed right. hard drive. Yeah. But CryptoLocker is a real wake-up call to us in that if you get this infection, both of your drives are corrupt. You have no mm-hmm. access to either of your RAID 1 drive mm-hmm. because the files are gone. They're, they're destroyed. You have no way to decrypt them. So, um, And also, you know, there are situations where people are taking a drive and backing up once a night kind of thing and taking it off-site, which sounds like a good plan, but I've seen it happen where, so then, you know, the infection takes place 5 o'clock the night before, manager comes in the following morning, plugs in yesterday's backup drive, and it overwrites it with all corrupt data. So uh, yeah. then again, you end up with absolutely nothing. So... It's got to be something that cannot be touched. And as Adam is saying, cloud backup solutions these days are fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as it is read-only, as far as, you know, can the virus access it? No. So Dropbox, Pogo Plug, all those things are fantastic. But if they're mounted as a mounted network share on your computer, say, you know, Pogo Plug gives you a P drive. Well, guess what? Your P drive is now wiped and destroyed, and all the data that's on it is destroyed. That's a very real threat. So, does malware bytes? Was that? Might have to dust off your old zip drives. I think so. that's a scary thought. Boy, oh boy! I think oh. they're about time for a comeback. I'm just yeah. saying. I like the zip drives. <laughs> Love floppies and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's the other thing too. I mean, thinking about zip drives and and you know tapes, tape backups and things. It's very time consuming to recover a large backup. If you're working on a network that is, you know, a large scale business, Mm -hmm. uh, even a small to medium business, it can take a lot of time and it can result in a lot of downtime and a lot of loss access to files if this infection takes place because the backups take a long time to transfer over and and to restore. So that's another thing. Does Malwarebytes currently protect against this iteration of CryptoLocker? Our pro version does. Okay. And and that's because it has a proactive, it, it, it prevents malware from execution. Our free version is just a scanner and won't do any good. I mean, it'll remove the CryptoLocker virus and the malware. Yeah, I hear. It. It's encrypted everything, um, but we don't we don't proactively protect unless it's with our pro version. I see. So we're looking at the difference between you know uh, malware bites the free version as being able to recover from you know any other kind of malware that just yeah is, is removable and then you're back to operation. But here's a situation where it's it's your files are gone if you don't have exactly. proactive protection. It's completely That's, unique. Yeah, it's scary stuff. So mm-hmm. good to hear the Linux is immune right now. Um, right. Now. We want to get our Windows viewers, we want to get you hooked up with a copy of Malwarebytes Anti-Malware Pro. Uh, Adam, thank you very much for providing that for us, for our, our viewer tonight. We're going to give away one copy tonight. Uh, basically, you know, this is a big threat, and I wanted to take time tonight to discuss it um, for the sake of our viewers, especially those who are still using Windows mm-hmm. on some of the machines. You know, the question will come up, is this a threat to virtual machines? And I'll let you tackle that. And you know, what, what's the scenario as far as, you know, virtual networks and people are using Linux as the host and, and Windows as a guest. For those who are not quite understanding what that means, what is the threat to those users? Uh, well, I mean, if they're using a Windows system and a VM, uh, presuming that, and, and they get infected with CryptoLocker, um, presuming that they don't, they don't have a, a shared drive that's just constantly open to the VM, 
um, they should be okay. But if that shared drive, even if it's on a Linux system, is connected to the Windows system mm-hmm. in the VM, and a cryptologer can get to to those files and, and encrypt them. So, I mean, it's really just about what, what files are stored where, and if it's running, all it needs is, is Windows to run as the operating system can make it run. So we're talking, uh, if, if a user has like a network attached storage or a NAS drive on their network somewhere that has Samba sharing to their virtual machine, then the virtual machine can become a conduit for this crypto locker to Or actually. even if you use something like VMware and just use a shared drive, I mean, sure. you easily set it up to have it so that your... The host uh, drive, even. Your home, your home uh, folder in Linux is connected to your VM mm-hmm. through the shared drive that's always open. Um, and if you get that those Bitcoin locker to the Windows, it has access to that shared drive in that home folder. So if you have any documents or images in there, it can still uh, encrypt them. It's it's however a- however Linux doesn't always like to use file extensions, so it might it might be safe. <laughs> it depends, I guess. Hey, this thing yeah. will corrupt ODT files and you know Excel, uh, uh, you know all the LibreOffice spreadsheets, everything. So yeah, it's it's. Scary stuff. So if you have any kind of network shares, then you got to be wary of this. So, yeah, if you're using a, a, a VM to do any sort of, you know, sketchy searching around on the internet, you know, doing sure. things, uh, going places that you don't necessarily trust, that like you should not keep a shared drive mm-hmm. connected to it, or even have it connected to a, you know, unsecured network. Yeah, we're going to see this coming through infected websites. Do these have to be malicious sites? I mean, people f- sometimes say, oh, well, you've got this infection. You've obviously been surfing for pornography or something like it's that. It's not always the case. There's, there's uh, types of, of infections, uh, vectors out there. Um, one is called malvertisements. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, it's just a uh, bad guy has hijacked uh, the ad service for any sort of legitimate site. And as the, ad, as the, as the site loads, yep. uh, ads from the ad service, it could be inadvertently redirecting or executing malicious code on the Yikes. system. Okay. So it could be any site, really, that's out there. And yeah. it's, uh, it's kind of up to the system administrators of those sites to keep them up to date and make sure that there aren't the exploits. And that's one of the reasons that we got away from um, you know bulk source code that's available everywhere, because that's so easily exploited. And suddenly yeah. you've got you know all this kind of malware happening through your own website. Mm-hmm. So... Um, that's a whole other topic altogether. But Adam, thank you so much for your time tonight. We're going to give away a copy of this software. I don't know if you want to stick around for that, but I know Adam Kajawa is joining us in the chat room at Category 5 on Freenode. So if you have any questions about malware bytes, about CryptoLocker specifically, how that affects you, uh, what kind of scenarios, I mean, certainly run them by Adam, run them by myself, and we'd be happy to uh, to assist you with that. But yes. it, it has to be taken seriously, folks. This is a really really big threat and uh, it is going around a- adam what kind of um scale are we talking about as far as the the largeness of the infection radius it's, if you it's really? growing yeah and and this particular malware is just a start i mean it, it's honestly it was easy enough for them to create this then it's just a matter of time before the source code for either this malware or other uh styles come out and mm-hmm. then you start seeing variants all over the place do the same thing it's obviously affecting Windows 7, Windows 8, um, so it's not something that, you know, it's not specific to older computers or anything like that. Um, do we think that we're more susceptible with, say, XP that is going to be losing support in April? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, XP is, is going to, we're going to lose support for it, yeah. Um, the biggest problem is that the third-party applications that run, you know, like, like Java, Internet Explorer, they all use older versions on something like XP. Yeah. So those are more susceptible to infection as well as XP itself. Um, but yeah, I mean, any operating system, and if it isn't yet, it will be. Yeah. Okay. So if you're running Windows XP, be warned that uh, it is mm-hmm. going to be basically expiring come April. And when that happens, there is not going to be any security support. So it's almost as, you know, you wonder if there are hackers lying in wait with a whole bunch of new malware just waiting to... For their opportunity. They're yeah. just waiting well, for A lot of them have actually already switched over to 7 or 8. They're looking for the bigger targets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, gotcha. There's less and less users every day of, of Windows XP. Once you know, everyone, like, everyone listening to this is probably telling all their friends and family why are you still using XP. Yeah, right. Okay, Adam, well, thank you so much for your time. We're going to give away a copy of uh, Malware Bytes Anti Malware Pro. So, Drawbot is in the chat room. Here we go, folks. Uh, let's see. 
There are your names loaded up from the chat room. I am Boris Karloff, Carly, Eric1212, Jim Gregory, Dave Maydu. Good luck, everybody. Sam Serif and Sprint Cowboy. This is for a free copy of Malware Bytes Anti Malware Pro. This is the proactive version that will protect you against these kinds of infections on a Windows PC. And it would work in your virtual machine, I presume, too. Hey, Adam, like you could install this on your virtual machine so that it yeah. would then protect you. Yep. Very good. Dreamer and Dennis Kelly, Rev D. Jenk. Oh, wouldn't it be ironic if Adam Kajawa won? <laughs> <laughs> just saw your name fly by there my man <laughs> that's funny if that happens we would redraw <laughs> <laughs> good guy and garby and napa polar bear flying through the names bill 777 gwg guru of the matrix here we go things are speeding up again this is a free copy of malware bites Anti-Malware Pro. What's this worth to us, uh, Adam? What is uh, the retail value on this product? Uh, $25. Yeah, very good. Is it a lifetime license? Do we need to renew it once a year? It is a lifetime license. Very nice. good. Speeding things up. Going through all the names. Opie and Paul are eight. go. I can sense oh, it's getting close to the end. Come on, Drawbot. Pick one. <laughs> it's Drawbot, come on. Doesn't want to offend anyone. He's like, oh, I gotta show everybody the name. It's only fair. At least ten times. I've seen Adam Kajawa about 40 times there. I think he's... <laughs> he's gonna win. Yeah. Just feel it. And the winner of Malware Bites Anti-Malware Pro is R.D. Blair. Congratulations. Congratulations, R.D. Blair. All you have to do is email us and uh, just claim your prize. I'll send it to, over to you by email. Yeah. Adam Kajawa, great to see you again. Uh, and uh, nice always nice to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Oh, and I just realized I've got you up on green screen. There we go. <laughs> always nice to have you here. Thanks for being on the show. And uh, Thanks. Glad to be here. Cheers. And uh, thank you for all the knowledge that you, you share as well. Where can we find you? Where can we find uh, more information about, uh, about you know, basic security uh, essentials and, and all the stuff that we need to know. Well, our website is malwarebytes.org, and we actually have a blog that we post on multiple times a week. Um, all of our security experts do, and then some. Uh, it's blog.malwarebytes.org. Nice and easy. Very mm -hmm. good. Okay, Adam. And actually, we have a, a blog post um, about CryptoLocker right now. If, if anybody needs a rehash of what I've talked about here. Great. Okay. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to actually track that post down and we're going to put a link to the direct Good. post uh, in the show notes for episode number 317 here at category5.tv. That way you can just get all the information that you need uh, to protect yourself from CryptoLocker. Again, Adam, always a pleasure. Thanks for being here and uh, have Thank a you. fantastic night. All right. You too. Thanks. Thanks. This is Category 5 Technology TV. I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson. I'm Chris Wells. Frightening stuff this October. Mm -hmm. But hey. <laughs> it's so a good nice build-up. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's <laughs> it's serious stuff, and I've seen a few infections go through, and uh, it's, it's not easy to recover from. Well, folks, I love that uh, we are still seeing loads and loads of new registrants on our website. Just want to give a quick shout-out to everybody. We're going to tackle this list. We've got God yes. Knows Zero Zero joining us. Tachos? Tachos? Like nachos and tacos together? Be, oh, nice. Tachos. <laughs> With cheese. <laughs> oh, how did I end up That's yours. a tough one? Go. <laughs> Oi Systems Tech. Uh huh. Um, sir, it sir, might be senior Wences. Uh, senor. Senor. Oh, senor. Ah, senor Wences. <laughs> See, I help. You did help. I did. J H fifty three seventy five. Nice to have you joining us here at Category Five. Mm -hmm. And Gavin Trex, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Gavin Trex, nice to have you here. Hey, if you'd yes. like to be a part of our community, it's absolutely free. www.category5.tv. Just uh, click on register up at the top there, and uh, you'll be a part of the show. 
Always nice to have you. Um, thank you to all the viewers who sent in donations to us this week. It's an exciting time yes. for us as we gear up to build Studio D and uh, to see your donations coming through. It just means so very, very much. And uh, it's just, you know, it's not just about, you know, building a studio and everything. And there's more information about it at cat5.tv slash studio. Mm-hmm. But it's about, you know, we're going to have a soundproof area, which, you know, is there are times when, you know, the children upstairs uh, do make a little ruckus. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, it'll just be it'll be nice for the viewers. But I think also for the for the crew here, it'll be wonderful to have our own permanent space. So right now we're still mm-hmm. in limbo and it's been about a year. Yes. So, you know, being in this temporary space, it's worked well for us, but going to be really nice to have our own space. Well, it is time. It's if that you time are again. Ready, I that think time. So. That which time? The news time. The news. The news. Or it's the not how news. You do it. Da da da. Da I act, I don't even have to make music because No, you don't because there's there is music. Is music. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Take <laughs> That's it away. That's good for everybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So, a uh, miniaturized wireless pacemaker that can be inserted into the body without invasive surgery has been appro- has been given approval for use in the European Union. Okay, so it can be inserted into the body but is yes. non-invasive? Exactly. Let's, that sounds like an oxymoron. Let's find out how. Okay, tell us how. Mm-hmm. Developed by U.S. startup Nanot- Nanostim. Nanostim, sure. The device is designed to be implanted intravenously, intravenous, oh, I can't talk, just in, <laughs> intravenously, there we go, directly into the heart. All right. It is Yikes. less than 10% of the size of a conventional pacemaker and uses a built-in battery. So I hope that battery works properly. Yeah, so, so it's pretty small. Yeah. They call it non-invasive, but they're going to jab it into your heart. Just inject it in there. Hope it works well. But, but, you know, no wires. So, so good. what happens when they have to change uh-huh. the battery? I don't know. Or is it one of those they smoke alarms that last for seven years and they just figure, I don't okay, know. Well, Maybe there's a button outside somewhere where you have to test it, you know, like you, sm- you test your smoke detector. But it says it's wireless. So maybe it's like communicates with... Maybe it's Bluetooth. Oh, look at that. I've only got 40% battery yeah. life <laughs> left. <laughs> Clear. <laughs> That's can't, how you charge it. Yeah. I can't use the little roller coaster this week. Too low. That's true. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. Brazil's government. Can I do one? Oh, well, okay. I wasn't even done mine. Oh, you're not done? He's so pushy. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, thought you were, I thought you were done. I wasn't, but you know, that's fine. Okay. So, as I was saying before, um, experts said it was an exciting development, but at a very early stage. Okay. The pacemaker has yet to receive full U.S. Food and Drug Administration approval. Hmm. Now you may go. Now I may <laughs> Thank you so kindly. No problem. Okay. As I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted. Right. Brazil's government has confirmed plans to create a secure email service. This follows revelations of cybersecurity techniques used, uh, cyber surveillance techniques rather, used by the U.S. and the U.K. President Dilma Rousseff... uh, posted a series of tweets over the weekend saying that the move was required in order to prevent possible espionage. She added the country's Federal Data Processing Service, or SERPRO, uh, would actually be charged with developing the system. Do you think it's possible? Encrypted email. Like, legitimately. And, you know, it just seems... As Eric would say, fraught with peril. Could it actually happen? Like, would it not have been developed by I now? I think it's going to cause, if, like, I think it would cause more problems than it would fix. Yeah. That's what I think. You're going to have to have the decryption key for the encryption. And, of course, that's going to be the first thing that's going to get exploited. Why don't we just go back to snail mail? That was fun. It was fun. It took a while. Everyone likes getting Nothing mail. like sending mail to the same city that you live in and it takes four weeks. That's exciting. It's always nice to receive something, <laughs> but it's always obsolete by the time it gets there. Not oh, really. well. Picky, Ooh. picky. Oh, I know. You're excited for this story. Okay, so let me guess the caption here. Okay. All right. So, new car holographic projection imagery triggered by the gas pedal, now available from Hyundai. Holographic imagery? Yeah, so it's what projecting you think it's a projecting guy. projecting a person it's there? It's projecting a guy. So it puts from you basically the rear on your view toes mirror. all the time that there's a person it's there. It's so that you can practice running down People. pedestrians. Yeah, good. Okay, was I close? No. Oh. Well, no. All right. All right. So back to like what it actually is. But good guess. Thank you. Yes. 
So a car that takes control of the steering wheel when it oh. detects the risk of a collision is being tested at a research facility in Germany. Ford said the obstacle avoidance system first warned the driver of danger and then took charge if they did not react. So it gives you a chance, <laughs> and then if they go, uh, then they take hey, control of the wheel. There's yeah. a guy in front of you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if you don't do something, what happens? Then they take control of it for you. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so the system scans up to 200 meters ahead by using three radars, a number of ultrasonic sensors, and a camera, which are all installed in the vehicle. Hmm. Okay, so I hope, like, what if it's dirty or something, though, and you can't quite see? And then people are just, like, just, just like, thinking swerving. at something? The thing just keeps on swerving because like there's bug. mud on there's the camera. There's a bug on your camera. <laughs> what would it think if a fly was flying toward it? <laughs> Never drive this thing up in Muskoka, folks. You'd be swerving into the all ditch, over the place. into the rock cuts. Huh. Huh. It says an additional built-in display shows a warning sign and sounds a chime. Oh, how nice. Oh, that's then, great. if necessary, it applies the brake, scans for a gap in the road ahead, and steers to avoid a crash. All right. Yeah. According to Barb Samar Samar Zish. I give you all the hard names. I know you do. Yeah. Vice President of Product Development at Ford's European Division, obstacle avoidance can sense a pedestrian or object coming across the path of the vehicle. If it doesn't sense you responding accordingly by brake or maneuvering, it will take over. The hmm. firm showed off the tech at the facility in Lamel, Belgium, last week. Krista? Cool. I like my idea better. Yeah, you know, it just keeps projecting people out there. So <laughs> if you were like really desperate, like Robbie, I'm sure, you could start up your car and project all your little friends and then you can have friends around you all the time. You could have like a, a You would a always trunk have party. friends. You have a trunk party. Pop the trunk, turn on the projector. <laughs> just having beers with, with a bunch of holograms. holographic friends. <laughs> Six pack is all you need, even though there's 30 people. It's great. <laughs> all right, an exploit... Uh, I should say an easy-to-use exploit backdoor has been found in seven different models of domestic routers made by D-Link and Planex. The backdoor, mm. if used, uh, would actually allow an attacker to take control of a router and a modem and spy on a home user's internet usage. D-Link has acknowledged the existence of the exploit and said that a fix would be available by the end of October. So far, the backdoor does not seem to have been exploited in the wild. Uh, the backdoor was discovered by security researcher Craig Hefner, who reverse-engineered the software used to control the D-Link DIR100 router. Deep analysis of the code revealed that a string of letters, if used the right way, could unlock remote access to the gadget. A string of letters. It's called a password. Uh, just one, two, three, four. Yeah. One, 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 one. <laughs> explanation mark. Password. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> That's kind of scary because, I mean, you don't really realize, but your router is kind of the, the, it's the entrance way mm -hmm. to your home network, right? So um, we're hearing more and more, you know, as we're kind of on the topic of security tonight, we're hearing more and more about hackers, if you will, maliciously using remote desktop on Windows PCs to access the user's computer and install Trojans and install malware to allow them to access other systems and, and even you know create botnets and things like that. So um, having access to be able to control your router, that's pretty serious stuff. It gives them access to every computer on your network. They could open up mm -hmm. ports, SSH to your Linux box and start brute forcing it and you never know unless you've got CSF installed. So that is scary. That is not not nearly as cool of a story as the car though. True. I'm just saying. It's just a router. Yeah, I know. A bunch of hackers. The pictures not even as cool. Plugging away at it. That's all right though. Yeah. Yeah, but if you're interested, you can get the full stories at category5.tv slash newsroom. This week, the category5.tv's newsroom was researched by Roy W. Nash, and had, we had contributions by our community of viewers. If you are interested in a story that you think of is worthy of on-air mention, you can email us at newsroom at category5.tv. For the category5.tv newsroom, I'm Krista Wells. 
Thanks, Krista. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and you'll find us online at www.category5.tv. I know that you've sent in your viewer questions this week. Uh, you can go, <laughs> pardon me, you can go to cat5.tv slash ask to do so. You can also send them in through the chat room, through email at live at category5.tv. Uh, do you want to pull up some of the uh, emails that we have received um, this week, and we'll just get through as many of those as we can sure uh, appreciate you sending in your questions folks that's what the show's all about and uh, we love uh, having your interaction so thanks for that all right so here's a question from bill 777 hey bill 777 he says i had submitted a question asking how to find um uh, find wine i had installed in point linux but after checking some it said that i only had a helper installed maybe oh. a better question would be how do i install wine in point linux okay so you're probably he's, thinking he says he's also new to linux so okay so you're likely thinking okay well, let's have some wine have some wine where do you get the <laughs> wine where is this I I've like I've learned that all these kind of names Any, and anything those that kind has of to do with food is ridiculous. So I'm starting to learn. Huh. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring up my computer screen here. There we go. And we're going to go into Synaptic Package Manager. There's two packages really that I need. I don't even know my password. It's password. Password. <laughs> More solid than that. <laughs> password one. Capital P. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I have an at symbol as a A. It's fantastically secure. Yeah, now everyone knows it. Yeah. Okay. Wine. Just do a quick search. You'll see that there are two packages that I need. First of all, wine and wine tricks. That's it. I've already got them installed. Um, wine. Wine tricks. Done. So you select those, mark for installation. Select that, mark for installation. I already have it, so it's all good. So then what's going to happen is you're going to say, okay, well, where do I find it? I don't see it. Oh, well, I have Wine Configurator and Wine Uninstaller, but where do I go to actually run a Wine program? So um, what we need to do is, first of all, go to Terminal. I, I'm thinking out in my head whether I've got a Windows program that I could actually use to test this with to show you, and I don't really. Huh. Imagine that. Don't huh. have a Windows application handy. But go to your terminal, okay? And I do have a Windows application running because I'm actually using Desktop Presenter in order to stream my desktop to you right now. This is a Windows program, and I'm actually using this to stream my desktop. And uh, we've covered that on the show before. But with Wine, all you do is you've got your executable. So say it's notepad.exe. So you just proceed that with Wine, and it will run it with the Windows application layer. So then you'll be able to run that application as uh, as if it was in Windows. But you're not. Let's see if I have any installed. Um, dot wine, drive C, program file. No, Windows. Let's see if there's anything in Windows. There might be like a notepad or something. WinHelp is there in the EXE. RegEdit, there is notepad. OK, so see, like if I tried to run notepad, like it's just you know there's no way to do that so what we do is we go wine notepad.exe and there it is that's notepad okay so i'm just using that as an example because i happen to have notepad right. on my system perfect so let's say notepad was the application that you wanted to be able to launch so now to create a launcher for that i could create a right click on my desktop go create a new launcher and we're going to call it an application and we're going to call this notepad we know it's a windows program we're going to browse to it all the same and uh you know what i can actually do i i've got it here i know that it's in my the path is irrelevant. The path just happens to be where my notepad is. Wherever you've put the executable file that you want to run. C slash Windows notepad.exe. So then proceed that with Wine. Okay. And then should be good to go. So now I've got a launcher on my desktop called Notepad. There it is. And if I double click on that, it did nothing. <laughs> That's so exciting. Let's put uh, quotations around it. Maybe we need a path to wine. User bin. It's probably in bin. Let's try. Locate. Where is wine? 
It's in, yeah, user slash bin slash wine. Okay. So let's edit that. User slash bin slash wine. Let's get rid of the tilde and let's actually use slash home and uh, Robbie dot wine drive C windows notepad dot exe. Have I done that right? There we go. So I didn't like that I had a tilde instead of my actual home folder. So you notice now when I double click on notepad, it runs just like a Windows program. It is in fact the Windows program. It's an executable file, exe. Um, this is obviously a wine version that they've created. It's like a clone, but it is, as you saw there, it's an executable file and it is running just fine. And you'll be able to run quite a few things. And as I showed you, I am running um, Desktop Presenter, which is a package from Telestream. And this is, uh, this is a Windows application. It's not designed to run on, Win on Linux, but it runs just fine. So we're able to actually show you the desktop because of that. So Wine doesn't really have a menu item as, as such. You have to kind of run the Windows executable file by using the Wine command preceding the, the file name. So if you've got like a setup.exe, you would go into the folder in Terminal, or you, you quite often you could just double click on it and it will run it with Wine. Uh, I think that's probably going to be the case in Point Linux. Um, you can try that. But if that doesn't happen, you can always go into Terminal and do it that way. So, hope it helps. Wine. Pardon me, and Wine Tricks. And Wine Tricks is a tool that from the terminal you type in Wine Tricks or hit Alt F2 and type in Wine Tricks and it will allow you to um, add packages, configure Wine a little bit easier, um, and, and that can be very, very helpful to have. So, hope that helps. Let us know, please. Or I can always remote in with TeamViewer as well. Good stuff. So, here's a question from David. David says, Robbie, could you Hi, please give instructions for doing the DD terminal command to copy and boot up an ISO with, specifically Bridge Linux LXDE? Can I give instructions on using DD mm -hmm. to copy and boot up an ISO? An ISO is a different yes. file, uh, a different um, hard file system type. It's, it's ISO 9660 or whatever. So you can't... I mean, you can't boot from something that you've DD'd from an ISO file, and you can't really DD from an ISO file. Not sure I follow you because it's it's a different architecture. It's like if you just directly copied a CD, the contents of a bootable CD to say a hard drive or say um, a flash drive and tried to boot from it, it wouldn't work because it's a different architecture. Um, you would need to actually convert it to a format, and DD wouldn't do that. Um, DD is for creating an image not a bootable one um, that is for per files like the type of architecture that it is so a hard drive is a hard drive is a hard drive a CD an ISO is a CD it's an ISO file you can't interchange the two because they're not compatible so you can't just un ISO something as a bootable hard drive um, so can you clarify that for me because I'm not quite sure maybe I'm just missing what it is that you're asking mm -hmm. and I apologize for that but I'd love to have you clarify that for me okay then here is a question from Rob Gore hey Rob Gore oh I have set up a PC, PC with Windows 7 and Linux oh oh <laughs> Windows 7 and Linux okay <laughs> Just what gave him a heart attack. You got to be careful, man. You got to say, I set With up a Linux, Linux and computer. Windows 7. Oh, and by the way, I happened to also put Windows on there for games or something. I don't know. For, what do you use Windows for? For games anymore? or something, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just whatever. <laughs> In Windows 7, I want to be able to disable all USB ports apart from one that will be used for the USB receiver for the keyboard and mouse. I know that you can edit the registry to disable the USB, but I believe that will disable them all. Do you know of any way that mm. you can select which USB ports to disable any program available that you know of? Uh, yeah, you could use, um, uh, specifically, you could use Endpoint Protector from endpointprotector.ca. We had Bogdan Oros on the show, and we talked about it. It specifically allows you to shut down um, parts of your computer, USB ports, for example, specifically. Um, whether or not that's necessary, um, I'd love to know a little bit more, Rob Gore. Is Rob in the chat room by any chance? Yes, he um, is. Here's the thing. Is it so that people can't plug in an external hard drive? Because you say you want to still be able to use your mouse. And that's the problem. If you And I just booted up a virtual machine here, so we're going to take a look. If you were to disable all your USB ports, guess what? You can't enter your password to log into the computer anymore because you have no keyboard. Um, if it's for 
hard drives, for example, that's probably the scenario here. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You don't want people to be able to plug in a flash drive and copy files. You don't want them to be able to um, install um, stuff from a flash drive or plug in an external hard drive and things like that. If that's the case, then we, we're going to take a different approach. We wouldn't just remove specific ports or we wouldn't turn off ports. We would just turn off the drivers that allow USB mass storage. Um, and that is a registry key, but it's extremely, extremely simple. And I want to show you how easy, that, in fact, that is. I'm just booting up this virtual machine that Becca and I created a little while ago. Uh, it's an image of the laptop. So we'll just see if that still works so that I can actually show you this, Rob Gore. It wants me to activate Windows. I'm not doing that because it's just <laughs> for the test. But it, it is going to let me in, so forgive the fact that it is showing as a uh, an unlicensed copy. It's not those of you who have watched the show know that it was there just as a test. Okay, but let's go into our Reg Editor. Because I don't want you to be afraid of doing this because it's, it's super, super easy. Uh, always back up your registry, Rob Gore, and any viewer who's watching this. File export. He says here, just quickly, um, it's to disable the flash drive and USB oh. Wi-Fi device. Okay, well, Wi-Fi is a, a bit of a different ball game. See how I just exported that? But here's what I want to do. Oh, and I, I seem to be... I'm just exporting so that you see that, yes, that's the first thing that he did was export his registry. Okay, looks like I'm already there. Local machine, uh, then system... Current control set, control. No, I want to go to services. And in services, you'll see one called USB store. This is how we're going to get rid of the storage driver. And this will actually work quite, quite well for you. I'm going to post the, all the info in the show notes for episode number 317. USB store. There it is. Okay, so there is uh, a particular key here called start. And that is, you know, when somebody plugs in a drive, what do you want to do? Three is the default. It means basically it's going to mount the drive. Four is we're going to disable the ability to plug in USB drive. So now if I hit OK, now if I actually reboot my computer, now if I plug in USB mouse, it's going to work just fine. If I plug in a USB flash drive, it will do absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. It's just as simple as that. So uh, Wi-Fi I'd have to look into because, of course, it's a different device that's being detected. You can disable USB ports in the BIOS, but then again, it's going to be a case where your keyboard and mouse are not going to work anymore. Uh, whether Windows can be specific enough, I think only if you knew the device or if it's a real security issue. Like if this was a business and not just a personal computer, I would say, yeah, get endpointprotector.ca. Go there, and in fact, you know what? Actually, I would still suggest you check it out, Rob Gore, if that is a concern for you, for your Windows machines. Check out endpointprotector.ca. There is, a just, I just remembered, a personal version of the software. Hmm. And if you could get that and install it on your computer, then you would have the ability to shut down all those kinds of services. And it would be a, at a price that's reasonable for uh, a, an individual user. Good. If you don't see it on their website, contact them off of the website. Tell them that I sent you, and uh, I, I know that they'll help you out. So uh, endpointprotector.ca. Thanks for the question, Rob Gore. Here's another question from uh, Orange Man. Hey, Orange Man. It says, Dear Robbie and host, I wrote to you last week about getting Skype working on my Zoran. I think you may have... Uh, may have understood what I meant. I was using the cheese program to test to see if Zoran responded to the video camera, then closing it down and then write, running the Skype program on its own. Okay. It works with audio only and the video is not working. I did this with both systems since I have a, a Skype system using Zoran and my parents use my old laptop with Zoran on it. I oh. did look into the options in video. It seems that the path to the video is pointing to USB camera. Um, in Skype? Yeah dash or slash dev slash video zero okay uh since i'm not very confident with using zorin at the present i still use windows it seems to me that the problem is that the camera is working on the laptop via cheese but not responding when using skype maybe the path is not right on skype okay. so i think i mi maybe misunderstood it is what I think that's they're what, saying yeah. which is not altogether impossible I was trying to put my head around it because it sounded like they had two webcams and we were trying to figure that out. Let's oh, okay. bring up... I'm going to show you one last thing that I can show you uh, here, Orange Man. I, it was Orange Man, yeah. Yep. Um, 
and and that is because you say cheese is working. Um, let's bring up cheese. This is going to turn on. Um, oh, you know what? I actually have Skype loaded here. I'm going to quit Skype. Now, sound and video, cheese. That's going to bring up our tiny little webcam here. Hello. Okay, Bye. so from there, what I want you to do is go edit preferences because we know that the camera is working in this scenario. So here we are in cheese and it's working. So now look at device and just make sure that it is what you're expecting in in uh, in Skype. So if it says slash dev slash video one, then we know that we need to change Skype to actually use a different path for the device itself. Because it's very possible that Skype is just defaulting to whatever the def like whatever the first thing is. And that could be any device. Right? So try that. Then go into Skype once you've closed cheese. Once you've got Skype up, go into the settings for Skype which is options and video devices and you'll see that dev slash video zero is selected if it's anything other than what was selected in cheese then you you want to change it there so make sure it matches what cheese said what cheese said <laughs> that's what cheese said oh i made it funny I hope that that helps. And if it does not, if your webcam still is non-functional, then I think that the best thing that for us to do would be to have me use TeamViewer to log into your system and take a look. That would be really the easiest thing for us to do. So you let me know and uh, just tell me if, if that fixed it, like if that helped. All right. But otherwise, I'm kind of shooting in the dark a little bit because I'm trying to figure out what it is that you're experiencing. And, uh, and I just hope that we're of some help to you. All oh, right, and here's one from uh, Rick Van Leeshout. Uh, hey, it says, here is a picture of his setup watching the live show. Nice. Let's see if I can bring this up for you. There it is. Look at that. Oh, he watches in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So you got backstage pass up there watching us from behind. There's the intro. Who's that guy? Who's that? That bald nerd dot com. And uh, the chat, chat room. room. Cool. And, I think you uh, need more screens. I think uh, bigger screens would probably be yeah. a good idea. Um, I think you should just mount them on your wall. It's like a life-size Robbie head right there. Oh, it's, that's getting scary. Yeah, it is. Watching us in life-size. Cool. Thanks for sending that in. I'll give you 100 viewer points. Let me know uh, what your username was. And uh, I'll check your email as well just to, to verify. And if I see it registered, I will give you 100 viewer points. Nice. Yeah. Thanks for the picture. Very cool. Do we have time? Oh, we uh, that's got all we like got. a minute and a half. Anyways. That's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Chat room, thank you so much for being here tonight. Krista, did you have fun? Oh, I have fun all the time, except when you insult me before the show. That. Before the and show. And then it puts, a, it puts a dapper during the show. That's all I'm saying. I'd be a lot more fun if you were nice to me. But it's <laughs> nice to be here. I am a hard guy to work with, I tell you. It's difficult no to put up with me, isn't it? <laughs> Just smile. That's that's all. You, that's all you're gonna give them. <laughs> that's it. You're just gonna leave it at that, like that I'm. If you can't say anything uh, nice, mistreat my then don't and... say anything at all. Ah, <laughs> oh, boy, oh boy. Hey, this has been a fun week so far. We've had a couple of late nights getting things ready for the uh, yes. for the the big fundraiser at cat 5tv slash studio. Thank you very much for the graphic work that you've done there. It Anytime. looks great. I think Krista's done a fantastic job branding it and making it look nice. So please do check it out, cat5.tv slash studio. All the details are there. I don't need to get into it right now. Uh, but that is all the time that we have for tonight. Can you believe next week Eric Kidd is going to be joining us? And the topic that we were going to look at tonight before this virus hit last week mm -hmm. is, uh, is uh, looking at how to use entropy to increase the security of our passwords. We're going to be doing that with Eric next week. So make sure you uh, you stick with, stick around. Garby, yes, unfortunately, uh, and we've never really mentioned it on air, but it's in my blog, uh, Spacefish passed away. Yes, um, it's very sad. A couple of weeks ago. So uh, information is there in my blog. But um, he, he was, he was such a wonderful about, little fish. He was with us for about <laughs> two years, a little bit more than two years, I mm -hmm. think. So, um, And it was actually when you first started on the show, we had a feature where we were naming space fish and it was a lot of fun yeah. so major tom it was 
and, uh, and that's it. So. Does that mean it's the end of my Cat 5 career as well? No, absolutely not. No, it I just gets better from here. Fish. It's just less work to tend to. So yes. there you go. All right, folks, have a fantastic week. See you next Tuesday. See you guys. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed the show. Category 5 TV broadcasts live from Barrie, Ontario, Canada, every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local showtimes in your area at Category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.